one or two minutes early, um, but we will in the meantime get our second speaker set up to, to, to present. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I will introduce him. Professor Stephen Knowles who is in the Department of Economics at the University of Otago. Uh, his research interests include the economics of altruism with a specific focus on what motivates people to donate to international development charities. Stephen will discuss the relative costs of intervening against COVID-19 across the world. Stephen. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so before I start my talk, I'd just like to thank the organisers for putting this together. So um, Philip Hill was um, very much involved in this. It was his idea. So thanks, Philip, for all the hard work you've done. And also Jackie Haddingham has been doing an awful lot of work in the background as well as being our host for these uh, talks for the last couple of weeks every day. So thank you, Jackie, for what you've done. And uh, the AV guys here have been extremely helpful too. So thank you for your hard work. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, all the other speakers. So I haven't seen all of the talks for the last two weeks, but I've seen most of them and I've really enjoyed them. And I've also learned a lot. Um, so what I'm talking about is the relative costs of intervening against COVID-19 across the world. And I just want to make sure that everyone understands before we begin exactly what I'm going to talk about. So it could be that some of you are hoping that what I'm going to do is say, well, here's been the dollar cost of fighting COVID-19 per life saved in New Zealand and compare it to what's happening in other countries. I'm not going to do that because as I'm going to explain, that's actually a really difficult task to do. What I am going to do is talk about what's been happening in the New Zealand economy in recent months while COVID-19 has been with us. Um, also talk about why it is extremely difficult to you know, talk about how much it's cost for each live we've saved. Um, but then to give a bit of a global health perspective, I'm going to talk about what we do know about how it's relatively cheap to save lives in developing countries around the world and poorer countries in the world. And that's not going to be uh, with respect to COVID, but just what we know in normal times. So let's have a look at what's been happening then to the New Zealand economy. And I should mention that um, the three graphs that I'm going to show you, two of which are on this slide and one of which is on the next slide, um, they are from the Treasury's website. And every week uh, on a Friday, the New Zealand Treasury puts up a, a new weekly update on the economy and COVID-19. Um, so the data I'm going to talk about are from last week's uh, information because this week's one I don't think is up yet. And even if it is, it wasn't up yesterday when I had to submit my slides. So in terms of what's been happening to the New Zealand economy, if we have a look at um, this figure on the left here, um, the key figure to focus on is that for the March quarter, New Zealand's GDP has fallen by 1.6%, which is the biggest quarterly drop uh, in the last decade. And now by the March quarter, we mean what's been happening for the months of January, February and March. And we know that much of that drop in GDP would have been occurring in the March quarter. What we'd really like to know is what's happened in the June quarter, that is the quarter taking in uh, the months of April, May and June, but that data won't be available for some time. But we know that you know, there was a pretty big drop uh, in the March quarter. So to get a fit, some sort of more timely data, if we have a look at this figure on the right here, this is showing retail spending by New Zealanders from February um, through to um, the 21st of June. And these data are a, a seven day rolling sum. And what we can note is that uh, back in February and early March, that um, retail spending in New Zealand was about $1.6 billion um, per seven days. But it's interesting to note that um, sort of fairly early on in March, that figure actually started to fall. So before we went into lockdown, spending was already starting to fall. And we can see a bit of an uptick uh, in here, sort of just before lockdown, as people are rushing out buying all the toilet paper they think they're going to need and, and food and other essentials. And then we can see this pretty dramatic effect here of spending falling very dramatically um, as we go into level four. And as we progress through level four, um, there's a bit of a slight increase there in spending as there's more stuff that we're allowed to buy online and people get more used to doing that. 
And then we have an increase in spending uh, as we go into level three, and then as we go into level two, and then again as we go into level one. But one thing we can note from this figure is that uh, retail spending now is pretty much back to where it was um, pre-COVID-19, but we've got this big chunk of retail spending in here that, that didn't happen and is kind of lost for good, as it were. Uh, What's happening in terms of jobs? Well, on this slide, I've got information on the number of people on either a job seeker or an income support um, kind of scheme. So these bars here in blue, these are the um, weekly changes in the number of people receiving the job seeker benefit. Um, and the figures in the sort of mustardy uh, color here, they're people that are receiving the um, recently introduced income relief payment. Uh, and obviously it's been fairly recently that uh, people have started receiving that. Perhaps what's of most interest is the black line here, which is focusing not on the rate of change, but the total number of people that are on some sort of income support. And back in January, that was just under uh, 150,000 people, uh, but now it's almost 200,000 people. So there's a, an additional 50,000 people who are receiving some sort of job support. And obviously, in addition to these people who are unemployed, we also have quite a large and significant number of people who um, are probably only still in work because their employer uh, is receiving the wage subsidy. And as the wage subsidy uh, is started to be phased out, then we might see further we'd expect to see further increases in unemployment. But for now, we've got about a $50,000, sorry, not dollar, we've got about a 50,000 person increase in the amount of unemployment. And what some people might be tempted to do at this stage is say, well, if only we could come up with an estimate of how many lives have been saved as a result of going into lockdown and the other policies that have been introduced to fight COVID, we could then work out how many jobs have been sacrificed for every life that's been saved. But I'm going to caution against doing that by talking about why it's difficult to put a figure on what it's cost New Zealand for each life saved from COVID-19. And there's basically two counterfactuals that we don't have. Firstly, we don't actually know how many lives have been saved as a result of the, the policies that have been introduced. Um, there are estimates out there, and Michael Baker mentioned um, his estimate um, in one of the sessions last week, I think it was last Monday, where he talked about information that he and others had put in front of the Ministry of Health and the government, suggesting that if we essentially did very little to fight COVID-19, that there could be an excess of 12,000 deaths. So let's just assume that there's been about 12,000 lives saved. I'm not qualified to talk about whether that's a reasonable estimate or not, but let's just imagine that it is. The problem we would then have, though, is that we simply don't know how the economy would have fared if we'd done less to combat COVID-19. Essentially, it's difficult to separate the effect of the disease from the effect of the lockdown itself. So I want to suggest that some, at least possibly many, of the jobs that have been lost would have been lost if we hadn't gone into lockdown. And to give some examples, um, international tourist um, arrivals in New Zealand would have plummeted even if we had not closed the borders. Overseas tourists would be worried about coming here because they'd be fearful about whether they could get home again. So many of those jobs that relied on international tourism would have been lost anyway. In terms of other jobs, and particularly in the hospitality sector, if we'd done nothing to fight COVID-19, then it seems likely that we would have had significant community spread of COVID-19. And that would have meant that even if it wasn't mandated that we had to stay at home, there would have been plenty of people who would have chosen to stay at home anyway. They wouldn't be going out to restaurants or bars or going to the movies. And in case you're not quite convinced on this point, I want to talk about some research that's done a comparison between Denmark and Sweden. So we know that countries with less severe restrictions have suffered economic losses. And to give one example, consumer spending in Sweden has fallen by 25%, which is almost as much as in Denmark, where it fell by 29%. That's even though Sweden did not go into lockdown, um, but Denmark did. Uh, and I've listed there um, the authors of that particular piece of research. So we simply don't know how many jobs would have been lost if we had not gone up the levels and ultimately gone into lockdown. And, and people might come up with 
estimates or guesses, but, but that's basically all they are. So what I want to think about now is, well, what exactly do we know about the sacrifices that New Zealand has made to save lives? And, you know, we've all seen many posters like that one there put out by uh, the Ministry of Health, encouraging us all to stay at home and save lives. And by and large, New Zealand's team of 5 million uh, were very happy to stay at home and to save lives, even though for many, that involve making great sacrifices. And we know that you know, there's a, a poll that was taken that shows that 92% of New Zealanders approved of the government's decision to go to level four. But for many people, there were major sacrifices made in doing that. And I'm just going to run through now what some of those sacrifices were. So for example, it might be that people were not able to visit family in hospital or, or in rest homes, not being able to attend funerals or maybe weddings that were postponed. There's plenty of examples of that happening. And then there's people who have had to accept a, a very significant pay cut in order to keep their job. And also we've talked about the people who have paid uh, a price of actually losing their job. And we know that so far there's about 50,000 such people. So what we do know is that most New Zealanders were prepared to make large, in some cases, very large sacrifices in order to save lives. And to bring a bit of a global health perspective into this, I now want to ask the question of, well, is it possible to save lives at lower cost? If there are New Zealanders who have developed a taste or preference for making sacrifices to save the lives of other people, are there easier ways of doing this? And the answer to that question is that it is. But these are the lives of people living in the world's poorest countries rather than the lives of people living in New Zealand. And the reason for this is that there's lots of low hanging fruit out there that's left to pick in these countries. And what I mean by that is low cost interventions with large benefits. And the effective altruism movement has drawn attention to the fact that those wanting to do the most good they can with their charitable donations would be best to target these donations to charities working uh, in developing countries and more specifically on health projects. And I want to talk about what some of these sorts of you know, low hanging fruit are. And I'm going to give an example of one that saves lives and another, that does, another couple that don't necessarily save lives, but have huge uh, positive impacts on people's health. So the first one, and this is evidence from randomized controlled trials, is we know that roughly about $1,000 spent on distributing anti-malaria bed nets in Africa will lead to 10 additional quality adjusted years of life. Now, one of our speakers earlier in the week noted that not everybody's that keen on the idea of quality adjusted life years from an ethical perspective. So if that's you, another way we could think about this data is to say it costs about $2,000 typically to save the life of a reasonably young person um, by distributing anti-malaria bed nets. Now, of course, the bed nets themselves don't cost $1,000. The typical cost of one of these nets is about $10. But not every net that's distributed will end up being used and not everyone who doesn't use an anti-malaria bed net is going to catch malaria and die as a result. And that's where randomized controlled trials are really helpful. We know that for every thousand dollars spent on distributing these nets that we get an extra 10 qualies. An example that many New Zealanders will be familiar with is the work of the Fred Hollows Foundation. And the Fred Hollows Foundation can restore someone's eyesight for about $100 in terms of the marginal cost of doing that. So that's not quite the same thing as saving a life, but it's certainly um, an intervention that can greatly improve the quality of people's lives. Another example that's often talked about is deworming of children. And this is extremely cheap. It costs less than a dollar to do it in your typical developing country. But it improves not only children's health, but also their school attendance. And there's some evidence that it can improve their uh, income uh, in later life when they enter the workforce. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit out there. But the question that this then poses is, well, you know, how generous are New Zealanders and how often is it that we give to international development charities, the likes of the Fred Hollows Foundation or World Vision, Oxfam, Tear Fund, etc. 
Well, according to the World Giving Survey, New Zealanders are amongst the most generous people in the world. In their most recent survey, we come in at third place. Australia's in second place, so um, we, we lose out to them, but uh, New Zealand is in third place. So on a whole, New Zealand is a very generous nation. But less than 10% of donations each year go to international development charities. That is the charities working um, with um, people in need in low-income countries overseas. And it's in a wee bit of a, an aside to this, a point that's been made by Tom Coop at the University of Canterbury is that if we look at the um, economic relief package that the New Zealand government has put $50 billion aside for, as part of that, there is some money that they've put aside for economic development uh, in other countries, particularly in the um, Pacific Islands. But the amount of money that's been put aside is about $1 for every thousand of that COVID-19 um, rescue package. And people might reasonably argue, I suppose, that it's the New Zealand government's job to look after the health and welfare of New Zealanders, not people overseas. But New Zealand, along with the other developed countries of the world, um, many years ago made a commitment to spend 0.7% of our GDP each year on international development, that is on foreign aid. Uh, and we don't come close to achieving that. Now, um, a research question that I've looked at uh, over the last few years with a couple of co-authors is to look at the question of why don't more donations uh, go to international development charities. And by the way, I should note that New Zealand's not alone in this. Most other developed countries have a fairly low share of total charitable donations going to international development as well. Um, one possible explanation for this that Trudy Sullivan and I have explored is that there's many more charities out there supporting people and causes in New Zealand than there are supporting uh, international development efforts. And if I was to ask you to, to name some international development charities, you might uh, come up with World Vision, Oxfam, Save the Children, Fred Hollows, you might name one or two others. But I'm sure you could name many tens of charities that are focused on domestic causes within New Zealand. And why is this important? Well, if there are people out there that give a small sum of money to every charity that asks them for money, or if there's an element of randomness in how people choose to what, which charities to give to, the fact that there aren't that many international development charities might help explain why they get a fairly small share of the money. So in research with Trudy Sullivan, we wanted to come up with an experiment where we gave people the choice of only two charities to donate to, one international development charity, and that was World Vision, and one charity helping people in need in New Zealand, and that was the Salvation Army. And the way that we did this was, a, um, was as follows. We donated from a research account $10 to charity in return for participants completing a survey. So we sent letters out to people inviting them to do our online survey and they knew that if they completed the survey by a specified date that we'd give $10 to charity and they could choose if that money went to World Vision or to the Salvation Army. Well, in terms of the results, 28.4% chose World Vision with the remainder choosing the Salvation Army. So even when we narrow it down to a choice of a, an international development charity or one helping people in need in New Zealand, that the majority still go for um, the charity helping people in New Zealand. And of the 215 participants that chose the Salvation Army, there were 133 who gave a reason for their choice of charity. And um, we can see the results from that on the, the screen here. I'm not going to go through all of these responses due to the time constraint that we've got, but you can see that 52% of those people made a comment along the lines of charity begins at home. And one thing I've been thinking about a little bit recently is I wouldn't be surprised if the number of New Zealanders who you know, sort of make arguments like charity begins at home, I suspect that number might have gone up as a result of what's been happening lately. You know, we're all used to hearing the message that if we want to help rebuild the New Zealand economy, that it's important that we spend money locally. And that's an important message, and I, I by and large agree with, with that strategy. But I think it would be unfortunate if as a country we became more inward looking as a result of this and forgot about you know, causes overseas that are important as well.
And another piece of research, and this is work done with um, Marat Gensch and Trudy Sullivan, um, we've explored um, the, um, the question of how uh, much New Zealanders care about how efficient their donations are. Uh, and we analyzed this using a discrete choice experiment. And this discrete choice experiment asked participants to make a number of peer-wise choices, and that generated information about how important they thought the following attributes were when making charitable donations. The first of those attributes is where the donation will be used. And there were three different levels here. One was New Zealand, another was a country close to New Zealand, and another was a country far away from New Zealand. The second attribute was the expected benefit to recipients, and that could be either low, medium, or high. And the third attribute was the need of recipients that could either be low, medium, or high. So in terms of the sorts of um, questions people were asked, so they answer a series of peer-wise trade-off questions like this one here, where they were asked which of these two hypothetical charities they would prefer to donate to. So there's the one on the left and the one on the right. For the one on the left, the need of recipients is medium, but the expected benefit of a donation is high. For the one on the right, the need of recipients is high, but the expected benefit is low. So if you, you know, cared a lot about need of recipients and not so much about how effective the donation was going to be, you'd go with this option here. And after going through a dozen or so peer-wise choices like that, the software that we use, which is the 1000 Mind software, I've got to put a plug in there for my colleague Paul Hansen, um, the software could generate for us information on how much weight people put on each of these attributes. And the information I'm about to show you is not the weight that was attached to the attribute, but instead the percentage of people who thought this particular attribute was the most important. And we can see that for over half of the sample, where the donation will be used was the most important thing to those people. Expected benefit and need of recipients was not you know, quite so important. So again, we see evidence of people placing more emphasis on where the donation is being spent, that rather it was spent at home than overseas, um, and they're not so interested in you know, the expected benefit, whereas I've been making the point that we can get more bang for our buck, as it were, to focus on health problems in developing countries, but that seems to be something that's not so important to the majority of participants in our research. Uh, also, as part of this research, participants were asked, in which country do you think a donation of $100 uh, to spend on the health of the poor would lead to the biggest improvement in people's health? And we gave people three options, New Zealand, a poor country overseas, or not sure. And we were interested to find out you know, how many people were actually aware of the fact that there's these opportunities to get uh, a lot for a small investment in poor countries overseas. And here are the results. About as many people thought that the money would do as much good in New Zealand as it would overseas. So there's a lot of people out there that simply aren't aware um, of what effective altruists would be arguing. So in conclusion, um, COVID-19 has had a devastating effect on the New Zealand economy. But it's difficult to separate the effect of the disease from the effect of the lockdown. Um, also, New Zealanders were prepared to make large sacrifices to save people's lives. Um, and for those who want to keep saving lives, it's possible to save the lives of people living in poor countries overseas with a much smaller sacrifice than what most of us seem prepared to make to save lives uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown here in New Zealand. That's it from me. Thank you very much, Stephen. I have a few questions that have come through. Mm -hmm. First of all, 90% uh, of the population supported the level four lockdown, but do we know what proportion of the population who were majorly affected, for example, lost their jobs, supported the level four lockdown? That we don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, so there was eight. There was eight percent of people who uh, didn't support the lockdown, um, and of those you know, inevitably, you know, given the number of people who have lost their jobs or had reductions in their income, uh, it seems inevitable that some of them would fall into that category. Um, but you know, I've also spoken to business people who think that you know, the best thing for what has been done was actually to go into lockdown for that period. Obviously, we hear in the media about business people who weren't so keen on that, but it's perhaps not quite so newsworthy to report people that were 
could be true. Um, is there any indication that New Zealanders have indeed increased their spending with local businesses and on New Zealand made products to support the economy since lockdown? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, anecdotally, you know, we've probably all talked to people who are more conscious of wanting to spend locally, and I've certainly talked to people like that. So I'm not, but I'm not saying there's no hard evidence on this. I'm just saying if there is, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Uh, hi, Stephen. In the slide displaying the DCE paid choice used by Jen Knowles and Sullivan, the country of recipients, New Zealand or overseas, did not appear to be included as an attribute. Was that part of the DCE? Oh, so, um, no, so uh, I don't, it might be useful if I could go back to the um, relevant slide. That, that is a good question, but I can't answer it. So if we go back to the, okay, so I can't actually bring up the slide, I don't think. So I think what the person asking the question is referring to is there was an example of a trade-off question that I gave. There were multiple trade-off questions that people answered and two thirds of those trade-off questions that they would answer would actually have the, the country as one of the things they were trading off. But the example I gave was focusing on the other two attributes. But yeah, everybody who answered it would have been asked questions about the country they wanted it to be spent in. All right. Yep. Uh, what, what actions would you, based on your low hanging fruit abroad premise, consider appropriate in relation to the economic struggles, both domestic and international, relating to COVID-19? So in normal times, in non-COVID-19 times, there's research that's being done by looking at randomised controlled trials that suggests that if we want to get the biggest bang for our buck, the best things we can do um, in terms of interventions in developing countries is um, anti-malaria bed nets and deworming. They're the two that are thought to be the most cost effective. Um, in current times, I, I'm guessing that just making hand washing and sanitation more available to people is probably one of the most cost effective ways of reducing the spread of COVID-19. But I have to acknowledge that speculation on my part, I'm not a public health expert. Mm -hmm. and possibly distributing hand sanitizer to developing countries or poorer countries maybe. Or maybe just a bar of soap. A bar but, of soap. but also running water is often something that's scarce in those countries as well. And, and that's what makes fighting COVID-19 for developing countries so much more difficult than it is here. For you know, I know hand sanitizer got a bit scarce for a while, but you know, it wasn't difficult to find a bar of soap and hand sanitizer remained in reasonable supply. But you know, we take running water for granted and in you know, many parts of Africa, for example, the water's not there for people to wash their hands. Yeah, that's true. You point out that some economic losses are attributable to changes in consumer behaviour in response to the pandemic rather than to the lockdown itself. And that is excellent. Uh, your point is excellent. It would seem worthwhile and could be feasible to roughly estimate that. Are you planning to do that? It might help make a debate on lockdown less simplistic. Personally, I'm not. Um, I, although I mentioned that sort of research, that's not the kind of thing I do. But I'm sure there'll be economists, um, including some of my colleagues, who are looking at that question. Uh, but one comment that I would make is it's almost too early to be doing those sorts of calculations. Now, if we want to compare New Zealand to another country, um, that other country, for all we know, might have had less severe restrictions than us initially, but if by the end of the year they've still got restrictions in place and we've managed to remain at level one, mm -hmm. doing the research now would you know, not give us a true picture of what's ultimately going to happen. So I didn't mention this during my presentation, but I think these questions about you know, which countries adopted the best strategies to maximise the, sorry, to minimise the, the amount of harm in terms of the medical stuff, but also minimise the harm to the economy. It's almost too early to be having those conversations because, as we know, the pandemic's still with many other countries around the world. This next question is possibly a bit speculative as well. Um, assuming there may be another lockdown, how will New Zealand cope with financial costs of the next lockdown? Labour has already spent 200 billion on lockdown one, how can they possibly afford the outcomes of lockdown too? Yeah, well, I guess the big hope is that we don't have to go into another lockdown. And you know, I'm not a public health person. So of all the people that have presented in the last two weeks, I'm the least qualified to talk about whether we're likely to go into another lockdown. But obviously we know that the, the economic costs of 
going into lockdown have been significant. Although again, I'd make the point, it's difficult to separate the lockdown from the effects of the disease. Um, obviously, if we had to go back into lockdown again, that would not be good for the economy. So, you know, business people, and I'm, I'm sure everybody is, you know, hoping that that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. so just to, to change the tone slightly in terms of uh, donations to international charities, and this is not directly related to uh, behaviour, choice behaviour, but how much of the money that you give to charities generally gets to the people that you want to help? So that's a really good question, and uh, what a lot of people would do is look at information on the charity's website uh, to see what amount of that money goes on overheads. And that's an easy figure to find, um, but what I would suggest, and, and many other uh, economists would argue the same, is although that's important information to have, the more important information is of every one dollar that gets through to be spent on uh, helping people in need, how effective is that? So you could have a charity with overheads of say 20% where they're getting $10 bang for your buck for you know, in terms of the money that makes it through to the people in need. You could have another charity with lower overheads, but you know, there's not such benefits in terms of what we get back for every dollar that gets to the people in need. Mm. Um, anyone who's interested in learning more about this, I'd recommend having a look at the uh, Give Well website. Give Well is a charity run out of the United States that's made a bit of a, a, an industry out of ranking you know, how effective different charities are and how effective different policies are at helping people in need around the world. So uh, another one would be um, Peter Singer has a website named after his book called The Life You Can Save. So that would be another interesting one to look at as well. But it's dangerous to focus only on the overhead costs and how much of the money gets through. It's more important to be asking if the money that goes through, how much bang do we get for our buck from that? Thank you, Stephen. Uh, one last question. Um, you mentioned that New Zealand was ranked third on the world giving scale. That's right. How is that measured? Is it the number of people you donate? So it's survey data that's based not just on how frequently New Zealanders and other people around the world give to charity, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also got information in it about volunteering and also performing you know, altruistic acts for other members. So actually, only one third of the, the weight of that survey is on monetary donations, but mm. volunteering and other altruistic acts are in there as well. In case anyone's wondering, the United States uh, came out in top, on top for the 2018 version of that survey, uh, which is the most recent one that's available. Thank you, Stephen. And that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much to Professor Stephen Knowles. And that brings us to the end of the COVID-19 Masterclass. I would like to thank all our speakers once again for offering their time and their expertise. I would like to thank you, our attendees, for your participation. And I also would like to acknowledge the e-conferencing team here at the University of Otago in Dunedin for their great work. You guys helped make this masterclass a reality. A big thank you to all of you. Namihi. <laughs>